So, um, welcome and uh, thank you for coming. This is the second session of the Philosophy of the Digital Image lectures here at the Philosophy Gallery. Uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I will start today's session from a quick summary, just to somewhat map where we where we arrived uh, last week, and hopefully um, build a bridge from that onto the onto today's session, which um, will really deal with uh, Martin Heidegger. That is uh, that is the aim. We'll see how well <coughs> it will work out. <coughs> so. So what, what have we what have we been talking about uh, last week? <coughs> well, we started from this um, essay by Jean-Francois Lyotard um, presentation, representation, unpresented, in which he puts formal, forward an argument that um, there's some places, some places here, and here. <coughs> um, he puts forward an argument that painting historically, since roughly the 14th century onward, performed not only an aesthetic, but also a political role. In as much as painting um, represented the visual organization of the, of the social space in the perspective of organization of its aesthetic space. So he draws a parallel between the way society is organized to the way the painterly space is organized. <coughs> Actually, let me just stop here. First, because I have a cough. And second, because there are a few things I, I wanted to say before we really get, in, get stuck into it. <coughs> in earnest. So, um, first, um, is that uh, we uh, we're going to have we have recording of the previous session. It is on Dropbox, uh, and it is uh, thanks to the uh, peerless work of uh, Benjamin Nansky, who is doing the recordings and the post production. So, thank you very much, Ben. Um, so the recordings are there uh, only for you at this stage, uh, so you can um, go over this um, stuff again. And I will uh, put them each week into the corresponding week folder. Yeah, that was the one thing I wanted to say. Was there anything else? If I think of something else, I'll, uh, I'll interrupt again. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Leonardo was saying there is this correspondence between the political space and the aesthetic space. The reason he wants to say that, it, it's important for him to point out that painting was performing a social function. Yet beyond you know, the well-known you know, glamorizing the upper classes and recording the wealth of the aristocracy, he was also saying it's doing something more uh, significant and kind of deeper. It is establishing a specific notion of subjectivity because when the viewer is standing in front of the painting they experience the world sort of spread out in front of them and this vista that opens up to their gaze corresponds to the vista that opens up to the gaze of the monarch when they survey their domain so painting and that is the kind of the proofs of the matter painting has a socio-political role to perform so, since the roughly the 14th century onwards. However, Leotard says this role of the painting that hinges on its ability to create realistic representations uh, was superseded by the invention of photography. So he says, when photography was invented in the first half of the 19th century, suddenly all these painterly skills that were honed over centuries 
and over many decades of the life of the painter became redundant because you could recreate this perspective of, with this perspective of accuracy. You could, you know, if, if what interests you is the, the stitching on the buttonholes, uh, then, then, you know, a photographer can do it quicker and better. And therefore, this um, political role of painting was transposed onto photography. Now, I, I have to say that Leotard is not that interested in photography in this essay. He is interested in painting. And the argument he uh, wants to lead towards is that at the moment when, paint, when photography took over these representational duties, it liberated painting to deal with what painting always wanted secretly to do, which is to ask, what is painting? Yeah? And because painting didn't need anymore to perform this social function, painters then started to, uh, to, to talk about feelings, to talk about the space of the canvas, and, and basically invented um, aesthetic modernism. So in a sense, you could say, um, <clears throat> photography performs, the role photography performs is quite similar, for instance, to the role the mechanical loom performs in the age of industrial revolution. The invention of the mechanical room, loom um, makes the work of the weavers redundant and along the way also invents industrial capitalism. And all the kind of upheaval of the social economic changes somehow also link to this mechanizing of the labor of the weaver. And something very similar, according to Lyotard, is happening in the transition when, when this um, estafet, when this sort of um, this uh, duty of um, representation, or as, as John Targ famously says, the burden of representation, is transferred from painting to photography. Painting for the first time in centuries suddenly is free from representing and can do whatever it likes and then and the rest is modern art so that's basically the story of uh, Lyotard he says some very interesting things uh, there along the way which I think are worth uh, reading and I highlighted in the re in the text on the Dropbox I highlighted a few passages that uh, I thought um, worth, uh, worth specifically paying attention to but what is um, the way I want to continue his way of thinking, and that's why that text serves for me a good entry into the discussion of the digital image, is that, so what, but what actually happened to photography? So photography took over these representational duties. Yeah? Photography is still in the kitchen, <coughs> representing. That's what my grandmother looked like, and that's what the Russian Revolution looked like. And this is the landing on the moon, you know, and all of this. Okay, that's all very good. And it goes on and on. However, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that the sort of thing that happened to painting when photography took over the burden of representation uh, happened to photography, or maybe you can say is happening to photography during this moment of the shift to the digital. And that is happening on several levels. So on the one hand, first, just by the simple fact that everyone has a camera and all the images ever taken are available online. So in the end, you don't, you don't so much need to take a picture as you need to Google it. And it probably will be there already. Yeah? Um, it's very doubtful that there is much need to make a picture of a landscape or a moonscape <coughs> or any of these things because you can just find them. Um, <clears throat> That's one aspect of this argument. The other is that there are new developments, such as 3D printing, that seem to me take over this representational burden. You know, it is not inconceivable that in the future you will do a 3D print of your loved ones to put little sculpture on your mantelpiece, if you will still have a mantelpiece. Um, and you might have a 3D uh, panorama of, of your holiday. Yeah? So again, it seems that there is this moment when suddenly photography doesn't really 
can can kind of transfer this estafette of representation, this uh, flag of representation, to other technological forms. And then the question becomes, what photography now can do? So perhaps, just as painting could discover its own essence in abstraction, in modernism, in cubism, <coughs> in impressionism, in minimalism, perhaps similar <coughs> concerns now become relevant to photography. Because photography now can stop representing and can start asking what it's like to be a photograph. Because, and that's why the question of the frame was so important, as long as photography is only showing you what is on the other side of the window, as long as photography is this transparent window that shows you what is happening on a distant comet, or at the bottom of the ocean, or inside your own stomach, or uh, you know, in Syria, um, we can know about all these exotic places, but we know very little about the window itself, so to speak, or the, the photograph itself. In order for photography to investigate its own making, or as I said earlier, what it's like to be a photograph, it needs to somehow let go of representation, or perhaps do something else besides. Yeah? That is the logic that Luther deployed in showing how modernism arrived at painting. And essentially, he says, modernism happened because of photography. Photography made <coughs> abstraction possible, which is ironic, because photography, as we know, it is not an abstraction. Yeah? It's very much the realism. Hello. Um, uh, but in being so realistic, photography freed painting from the burden of being realistic. And painting went and discovered, sort of became concerned with what it's like to be a painting what it's like to paint. So for instance, then you have uh, people like Cezanne staring at a bowl of fruit intensely for weeks and weeks on end until it's all kind of blurs into some kind of mess. And then he paints not what apples and pears look like, but what looking looks like. Okay? So that's <coughs> basically what but well, roughly the, um, the summary of last week's um, discussion. So, any questions so far? <coughs> okay. Right, so from that, I want to move towards talking about uh, Heidegger today. Um, and maybe before we move in earnest into Heidegger, okay, it's, not, it's, not, it's still a small undertaking, and I'm slightly hesitant, like a mountaineer kind of looks up at the peak of the mountain and says, <laughs> really? Um, uh, so I want to offer you a, a, a short um, palate cleanser uh, before we move on. Um, I want to say that generally speaking, philosophers are people who deal with concepts, while artists are people who deal with percepts or perceptions. And scientists are people who deal with facts. Um, so that, that's quite important to bear in mind. And when it comes to concepts, it, if you allow me for a second to be incredibly crude, I would say that each philosopher has one main thing that becomes their thing, and they investigate it throughout their life. And you can even be <coughs> brazen enough, or maybe <coughs> audacious enough, to summarize, not to summarize, but to somehow point to a single concept that lies at the foundation of the life work of a philosopher. So for instance, Plato. Yeah? What was Plato's big idea? idea. That's a trick question. Idealism. Huh? Huh? Idealism. Correct. Plato's big idea was the idea. He came up with the concept of the idea. For that reason, Whitehead can say that all Western philosophy is footnotes to Plato, because we still find it incredibly hard to think without ideas. 
or to somehow operate without ideas. I would want to suggest throughout these sessions that the digital image points towards a way of thinking or being, building concepts that does not involve ideas, or at least not in the same way. But we will see to what extent um, I might be successful. But that's right. So, so, so Plato, the idea. Aristotle, substance. Yeah. And that's why um, in many paintings, um, Plato is uh, pictured uh, pointing upward, and Aristotle pointing downwards. Because for Plato, ideas are this reality which is outside our sensual comprehension. And for Aristotle, it is the substance, which is all down there. <coughs> OK, let's move, let's move forward uh, some, some um, 1,500 years. Descartes. What was Descartes' big idea? Sorry? Exactly, yeah. Well, what does it mean? It means, well, thought. But even more, even not, uh, to be more precise, not so much thought, but doubt. And we'll come to Descartes very later on today, I hope. So I will uh, speak about it in slightly uh, more length. But Descartes said, I, I, I might not be sure of anything, because I might be dreaming right now. So maybe there is no table. I just think there is a table. Even if I lean on it or sit on it, it might be just my imagination. I might be hallucinating. Maybe I had too much cheese last night. Um, and um, I, I, I can I can be I cannot be sure of anything. You might not really be here, you know, because I can just press, as he says, on my uh, eye, and I can see double. It doesn't mean that suddenly you double. So maybe you in singular in singular is also a kind of optical illusion. But the one thing I can be completely sure of is my doubt. I can doubt anything besides doubt itself, because even when I doubt doubt. I still doubt. Yeah, that's, that's the philosophical sense of humor. You will get used to it. Um, <clears throat> for that reason, he takes doubt as the foundation of his philosophy. And we still carry this burden until today. We, we will get into it a little bit later. Um, so that is the question. For every philosophical system or a model, the problem is the big problem of philosophy is that you have to start from somewhere. Yeah? You have to write the first word on the page. You have to put your foot somewhere. But where do you put your foot? I mean, on the floor? OK, but where the floor came from? So, so you <coughs> somehow have to, you have to establish the ground on which you stand. But how are you going to establish it? Well, then you need, do you see the problem? Every philosophy comes against the impossibility or the difficulty of the question, what are you taking as your starting point? So Plato said, I'm taking the idea. Um, Aristotle, I'm taking the substance as my starting point. Descartes says, I'm not taking the idea and I'm not taking substance. I'm taking doubt as my starting point. Yeah? So the whole question of the origin is suddenly placed in the head. Because where is doubt? Under a rock? In a tree? Uh, no, it is in your head. Yeah? So suddenly, that becomes the place from which philosophy starts. OK, let's go on a little bit. Uh, Immanuel Kant. What is Kant's big idea? It is reason. Yeah? But we're still very much in the shadow of Descartes. Yeah? But it's reason. And uh, later on, we may move to, for instance, Hegel. And in Hegel, the great, the big idea is logic. One of his great books, books is called Logic. OK, so you see how this trajectory from Descartes, moving on through doubt, then reason, then logic, and <coughs> every time someone comes after a while and says, ah, no, this is not quite right. There are still too many holes. There are still things that don't quite fit. So here comes Nietzsche. Nietzsche. And what is his great idea? Nietzsche wanted to completely reshuffle this deck of, uh, of cards. He wanted to completely step away from idealism, from working with ideas. And he said, no, the very basic principle is not 
Doubt is not reason, is not logic, is power. The will to power. What is the will to power? Is the will to live. The will to live, the will to survive, and he, um, he was very much a man of the um, 19th century. He's familiar with Darwin. Um, so this will to power is a very interesting notion because um, when you later come across Alain Vital, um, you can see how, the, and, and we will come back to it uh, several times during this course. <coughs> He's trying to say we, we can step away from idealism, we can step away from logic into something much more instinctual. In a sense, he tries to upturn the whole card of thinking inherited from the Greeks. Now, that perhaps worked to some extent, but not everyone agrees. Um, then we have Heidegger, our friend with whom we spent some time today. Heidegger says his, his great idea is not power, is being. He says, before there can be anything at all, it has to be. No, we say, for instance, we say the bottle is on the <coughs> table. Okay, the bottle is on the table. True enough. But what, where the is is? So we know we, we know where the bottle is, but where the is is, where the is came from, that becomes his big question. A question to, to which he dedicated his whole life. Um, so you see how it works. Every philosopher pokes a hole in the previous one, but what you need to understand, it's kind of important also to the way you, I think you can kind of manage or handle this course. No, no one comes and says, you know, it's not about replacing one thing with other. It's about finding questions to which the previous model has no answers and trying to develop an answer knowing full well that this answer is also not kind of will have its own problems yeah and um, <clears throat> so we are now already in the middle of the, 19th, of the 20th century and then what what is left Foucault Michel Foucault what is great beef what is he really interested in Foucault is interested in the question of truth not being but truth and not any kind of truth, not, not the veritas, the Latin notion of truth, not even the Greek notion of aletheia, the one Heidegger is so in love with, the uncovering of truth, not the truth of the mathematical proof. He is interested in truth as parhesia. What is parhesia? Is the truth spoken at the moment of personal danger. So for instance, when Socrates is walking around the city of Athens and going to citizens and saying, hey, mate, are you sure you're doing the right thing with your life? He knows that he's putting his life in mortal danger. And this knowledge gives his quest, this particular force, the, par the parhesia, or parhesia. Speaking, of, speaking the truth when there is a danger to yourself. When, for instance, uh, people in the city of Homs film um, the, the air assaults on their mobile phones. This is another example of perhaps <coughs> because you are speaking the truth at the moment of danger. That, that was Foucault's main focus, especially in the second, uh, in the late part of his life uh, um, during the years when he was giving the lectures in the um, Collège de France. Um, okay, what else we have? We have Deleuze, whom we also uh, speak about in this course. Deleuze shifts the discussion away from questions of truth and being to the question of design. And he says, if you really want, and you can see how it connects to Nietzsche, to, to the notion of power, he says, life doesn't start from logic, it doesn't start from reason, it starts from desire. What kind of desire? Well, desire to live, desire to procreate, desire to warm your old bones in the sun. That kind of desire. Yeah? And for that reason, he calls us desiring machines. Desiring machines. We'll get to that. 
Um, this is really, really mild. But yeah, well, you get the picture. That was just my um, quick kind of summary of <laughs> the last 1,000 years. Um, so, um, and now we can move on to Heidegger. And here already we have, uh, we encounter a bit of a difficulty. Uh, because it is difficult to talk about Heidegger. Um, Deleuze and Guattari, in their wonderful book, What is Philosophy? The last one they have written together. <coughs> they say, it is really hard sometimes to be a Heideggerian. And I agree with them. It is, it is really, really hard. Um, well, and why is that? Well, not least because uh, Martin Heidegger um, was a Nazi. Not a kind of soup Nazi, as they say in science field, but a real card-carrying member of the Nazi party. Yeah, sad but true, embarrassing for us. Uh, but yeah, so I, I need to say a couple of things about it because I don't want to just you know uh, pretend that it's not a problem. I also don't think that it is the most important thing. But it is an interesting thing. How come we sort of you know sitting here around the table? discussing a person who really was part of, 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 of the most awful thing. Uh, I don't believe <coughs> that you can separate philosophy from politics. I think these things are deeply connected. And I think looking at Heidegger is always dangerous because there is a deep connection between his philosophy and his politics. And the reason it is dangerous and the reason it is complicated is because his philosophy is also very, very interesting and really profound. And at the same time, it is connected to really terrible politics. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to, as some people um, did after the publication of his anti-Semitic black notebooks, are you going to say, no more Heidegger in my life? Well, maybe, maybe it's, it is a possibility, not for me, you know, and I'm saying that as a Jew. I don't think it's possible to discard Heidegger because we don't like his politics. His philosophy is somehow deeply relevant. At the same time, it's a massive embarrassment for philosophy. You know, how come? You know, the most, one of the most interesting philosophers of the 20th century is also an Nazi. However, you know, let's not be too smart about it because one of the most interesting photographers of the 20th century made documentary films for Hitler. So, you know, you win some, you lose some more. You lose some, and you lose some more. Um, Lenny Riefenstahl, and we're going to, um, I will ask you to watch your film, um, The Triumph of the Will, I think in a couple of weeks. So you see the territory. But again, I mean, the, still, the question still remains, why do we need to engage with this man called Heidegger? The simple answer is, Heidegger understood something about the image and about art and also about the way this thing we call the digital age that very few understood besides him. And he influenced a whole trajectory of thinking that would not be possible without him. When today people talk about the Anthropocene, when people talk about the post-human, when people talk about well, the Greens or Gaia, behind many of these movements, there is a reading of Heidegger. So it becomes quite important to understand what this man had to say. Um, any questions so far? <coughs> Anyone here read any Heidegger? Okay, um, <clears throat> so I thought to give you the measure of the man, we're just going to look at one short quotation from um, an essay which I didn't ask you to read. I asked you to read this very famous and interesting essay, um, The Age of the World Picture. And we're going to look at it uh, in depth today, well, relatively in depth, because I hope it is dealing with some of the issues that we discussed last week. If you read the essay, you will see actually the notion of the frame and, the and framing, what he calls Gestell. 
acquires significance. And all the kind of very interesting and boring discussion right here about representation becomes a big concern with this. The whole, this whole book from which the essay is taken and on the drop of there is a, the PDF of the, of the whole book. Um, in English it's called the question, concerning the, <clears throat> the question Concerning Technology and Other Essays. The whole book essentially is an investigation of what does it mean to represent. What is representation? And he approaches it through um, various, in, in various ways. If we had more time, I would also love to read with you the question concerning technology, because it is an absolutely fundamental essay. But um, I will try to compress both these essays into the discussion today. So here is a little quotation from the, his inaugural lecture when he became a professor in the University of Freiburg in, I think it was 34, 33. Um, <coughs> And the, the title is, <coughs> What is Metaphysics? Um, so, <coughs> I, I can read it, but I would also really appreciate if anyone would like to read it. Is there anyone here who, um, who would like to, to read the quotation? OK. <coughs> But what is remarkable is that precisely in the way scientific man secures to himself what is most properly his, he speaks of something different. What should be examined are beings only, and beside that, nothing. Beings alone, and further, nothing. Solely beings, and beyond that, nothing. What about this nothing? Is it an accident that we talk this way so automatically? If science is right, then only one thing is sure, Science wishes to know nothing of the nothing. <coughs> Ultimately, this is the scientifically rigorous conception of the nothing. We know it, the nothing, <coughs> in that we wish to know nothing about it. Great, thank you very much. So, this is classic Heidegger, you know, <laughs> as you might say. Um, and what is remarkable about Heidegger is that he uses a very simple language. You will not find here the sort of philosophical terminology that puts people off philosophy. He isn't talking here about ontology, epistemology, hermeneutics, or any of these kind of big words that no one really uses. He uses simple words that you will find in any kind of, you know, the first, my first 200 words in English. But he uses them in a way that creates something different. He uses them in a way that he slightly throws you. There is a kind of, it's almost like a conjurer's trick here. Can you see? So what is being said? What is remarkable? That <coughs> precisely in the way scientific man secures to himself what is most properly his, he speaks of something different. In other words, when the scientist, when the scientist makes a claim about a fact, like saying, this is the moon there, yeah, or this thing weights 500 grams, yeah, or any kind of any sort of scientific thing you can think. Of. Whenever a scientist or the scientific community or the world of scientific knowledge makes a claim, it also speaks of something different. So, in other words, something is always being smuggled into the scientific discourse. What being smuggled? So the second sentence, you need to understand it as the direct speech of the scientist. So it almost needs to be in, uh, in inverted commas. So the scientist now speaks, yeah? So imagine the, the, white, um, the white bathrobe or whatever they wear, the scientists, yeah? Um, and the clipboard, yeah? And, um, and the scientist says, what should be examined are beings only. Beings only, and besides that, nothing. Beings alone, and further, nothing. Solely beings, and beyond that, nothing. Yeah, that is the scientist making a stake and, and making a claim for the scientific territory. Beings alone, and besides nothing. That's like Aristotle saying, substances. Bring me substances, I will investigate them. I will study them. Don't bring me ghosts. Don't bring me spirits. Don't talk to me about ideas. I want the substance. 
And besides that, nothing. <coughs> so, and then Heidegger <coughs> goes back, you know, to speak in his own voice. But what about this nothing that he'd want to know nothing about? Is it an accident that we talk this way so automatically? Suddenly, he moves the whole discussion into the dimension of language. So it becomes about how we talk. Yeah, that's the conjurer's trick. That's the little sleight of hand. It's very interesting <coughs> how, why do we talk about the nothing? Is it an accident that we talk this way so automatically? Well, it's not an accident. Because if science is right, then only one thing is sure. Science wishes to know nothing of the nothing. That's another one of these philosophical jokes. Um, ultimately, this is the scientifically rigorous conception of the nothing. What, and, and you know, that is actually the question for any scientist. What is your conception of the nothing? And ultimately, Heidegger says, ultimately, the scientifically rigorous concept, conception of the nothing is that we know it, the nothing, in that we wish to know nothing about it. Yeah? Now, I don't know about you, I always, um, in my moments of gloom, I always go back to this quotation and it cheers me up. Uh, there is something really um, uplifting about it. How, how can, the question is, how, what kind of sense it makes? Um, now, you can sit here and either agree or disagree with Heidegger, but, but that will be, in a sense, missing the point, missing the opportunity he proposes. He is not asking you to agree with him. He is not asking you to convince him that he is right. He is not asking, he is not saying, look, I have another science here which is better than the other science. He is not making a claim for a new scientific discipline that nothing, nothing knowledge. You know, he's not saying, well, you know what we need to, just like we now have anthropology and geography, and I discovered this new territory of the nothing, and now we need resources, and we need research, and we need PhDs to investigate the nothing. He is not saying that. He is saying there is a fundamental deficiency in our scientific thinking. There is a fundamental handicap. You want to ask a question? Just one second. In, in, in this... Um, in the way we think, because we, with our model of thinking, we can only grasp what we, in advance, determined as the grasshopper. Yes? Yes, I mean, there is like, oh, well, then he does. This is absolutely then he does. This is the art of uh, Marguerite as well, isn't it? So you and that's why... And out of the window, and you see precisely that what you think you're going to see. And you're going to project yourself into every single situation, and that's what he's... You are absolutely right. Yeah. Well, Heidegger wrote this, and um, that's from his What is Metaphysics. Um, I think it's in the 30s. I, I don't guarantee the, 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 the exact, but it's in the 30s. Derrida is the 60s. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Derrida is definitely a student, but, but not only Derrida. Every, that, that basically, if you want to see from which point what we call postmodern thinking or postmodern art emerges, it's from this. And you're right, you're never going to understand Magritte, you know, Senator Peep, without understanding what Heidegger is pointing into. Now, Heidegger is, of course, not the first who points out <coughs> the deficiencies and the paradoxes of the scientific method. For instance, throughout the history of the scientific method, there is a parallel history of mysticism, alchemy, uh, astrology, uh, which kind of really tries to deal with nothing in various ways. Yeah? So, and, and in his um, doctoral dissertation, he writes about the medieval <coughs> philosopher Don Scotus. Um, so there are precedents. Heidegger simply um, re <coughs> restated this argument forcefully and incredibly beautifully for the 20th century. Yeah, and when later, um, so Derrida, I think, is a very good example, and we're actually going to talk about that, uh, maybe even a little bit um, today. But I just want to, um, I, I think this is really fundamental in, in 
making sense of so many discourses if you, let's say, walk into a contemporary art gallery and you look at something and say, well, it really doesn't make sense. What is that? Well, very often it is a way to somehow get to grips with the nothing. Now, let me give you a little bit of a philosophical background. <clears throat> so, Heidegger is a German philosopher, well, that, and um, he is writing after people like Kant and Hegel. With Kant, he has a very complicated relationship. He wrote a beautiful book um, about Kant and the origin of metaphysics. You could even say, if you, if you twist my arm, I will say that Heidegger is kind of Kant on steroids. But we don't need to go into that. But what is really important is that <coughs> he sees himself as opposed or in a direct confrontation with Hegel. And what Hegel said, Hegel, as you remember, logic, he said in um, the philosophy of right, his um, uh, small book, um, the philosophy of right, in the introduction, on I think page seven of the, of the introduction, he says, <coughs> what is rational is real, and what is real is rational. Yeah, for, for Hegel, that was the formula with which to grasp the world. The world is <coughs> rational, and, and that's it. What is rational is real. How do you know what is real? Well, the real is that which is rational. Yeah? And it works the other way as well. What is rational is real, and what is real is rational. And Heidegger is not arguing with that. He is not saying that it's not correct. He says it is correct, but it's just not the truth. He says, yeah, if you decide in advance that you're only going to deal with the things that your rational method can deal with, then you're never going to run into any contradictions because everything that you deal with will be rational. But he said, there are ways, there are vast vistas of existence that fall outside of the rational, of which your rational method, by, you know, ipso facto, as that's a very nice Latin expression, ipso facto, which means by dint of the fact, you know, by the very fact that you are rational, you're not going to be able to deal with anything that is not rational. Now, you might want to ask yourself at that stage, is there really anything that is not rational? And I leave it for you to ponder. Uh, but Heidegger clearly thinks that there is just one thing that <coughs> the rational mind or the rational way of thinking can say nothing about, and that is the nothing. Okay. Any questions so far? <coughs> yes. So, um, is he actually saying that there is no such thing as nothing? No, 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 no. He's not saying that there is no such thing. He's saying that not the nothing is something that the scientific method cannot grasp. What you want to call, what you want to understand as the nothing is at the moment an open question. For Heidegger, the nothing is being. And, and Heidegger says, not in this quotation, but that's basically the main timbre of his investigation is that while science investigates substances like, you know, flasks and tables and the air that surrounds <coughs> them and all these things, um, it always fails to address the being of the substances. And it's the being of things that for Heidegger is the nothing. And what does it mean to be? That is the question. The question then becomes, what does it mean to be? To be, it's not a question of <clears throat> a thing or an object. For Heidegger, it is more about <clears throat> how you are installed in the world, in what way you are in the world. Um, it's, I don't want to preempt it too much, but let's just say that this thing here, Heidegger says, 
And it's, again, coming from another essay of his that's called The Thing. Um, but what is the thing? I just want to stop you for a second. Do you know the Latin word for a thing is re? In media stress, in the middle of things. Yeah? And, and our word reality is also from this word re, thing. So reality is the existence of things. Yeah? What is real is things. So when Heidegger talks about the thing, he also talks about the real. And then he says, the thing can never be fully explored scientifically because science might investigate you know, the atomic weight of every component of this flask and exactly how much volume it has and how much weight it has and all these things. But it can never explore its actual, the notion of its actual presence. That where Heidegger, as a phenomenologist, brings in the question of, of use. You know, what, what does it mean for, what, what does it mean in your life? You know, well, it might be nourishment, it might be education, <coughs> it might be a gift, it might be um, poison, I don't know, it might be various things. But it is through investigating the way the thing is connected to your projects on this earth, that its real essence can be explored and uncovered. And it is precisely that which the science, science can say nothing about. Now, I'm not, I don't want to do um, more of, 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 of that, because I can immediately see how you kind of start getting sort of agitated and you have, uh, <coughs> and you, you, you will very soon have various objections. It is, it is very easy to object to that. What I want to say is that Heidegger is basically saying, look, <clears throat> rational thinking or scientific thinking is leading you down, down, down a narrow path. A narrow path in which what will be uncovered by this method is predetermined in advance by this method. So in terms of uncovering things, it's infallible. It's never going to put a foot wrong. And if it will put a foot wrong, it will correct itself. There's no problem with that. No one says that science produces wrong the results. The results are right. The problem is that there are areas of existence where science simply doesn't go. I will give you a very irritating example. Um, you know um, zoology. Yeah? And examples, you know, examples are well, they're, they're, they're like a, the, the ring of the bell in the Zen monastery. They are just little moments of awakening. They know, or like maybe like a, like a shot of espresso. Don't you don't need to think about it too much. It's just like a suggestion of how things could be could be looked at differently. So you know, zoology, the study of animals. Now, arguably, zoology knows everything there is to know about all the animals and knows how to classify them into fish, into uh, mammals, into birds, and all that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but what about an animal like the unicorn? For instance, what zoology can tell us about the unicorn? Well, not much, you know, as, as it happens. For, the, for, so for a zoologist, the unicorn is precisely the nothing. Now, is it because the unicorn is not an animal? Well, it is an animal. At least it's an animal of sorts. Yeah? <coughs> but always not enough of an animal for the zoology of the interesting. Yeah? So it, is become, it becomes the nothing. Yeah? So it kind of... <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, I can see how it can, you can easily demolish this, this objection. But if you will hold for a second demolishing it, it kind of shows the limitations of our, of this system of classification. It could, it, you could imagine another system of classification that includes not only living animals, but also mythological ones, and also drawn with a brush, and also the ones belonging to the emperor, as uh, Foucault mm -hmm. says in the introduction to the order of things. Um, and actually, it comes from uh, Borges. <coughs> you can, um, you could imagine another way to classify in which 
the poor unicorn will get onto Noak's Ark, you know, and will get saved. But as it happened, it didn't, you know, because it didn't fit into any of the categories. How are you doing? Are you ready to carry on? Okay. Just, just on this, um, is it also that science is excluding nothing? Is, it, is science acting also? When he says here, and what about, uh, what would you say about nothing? Nothing. Yeah. So science is telling you not to think about it as well. Yeah, yeah. It's not just not covering it, it's actively excluding it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is actively excluding it. Because what science doesn't want to know about? Science doesn't want to know about hallucinations. It doesn't want to know about dreams. It doesn't want to know about death. You know, but ask a scientist what is death. And, you know, um, ask a scientist, you know, why um, you like chocolate ice cream and I like vanilla. And that's kind of, that's not what science dealing, is dealing with. Now, of course, you can say, yeah, you, but you, you could examine sort of some, the molecular construction of your tongue. And that's kind of not the point, you know. Um, <clears throat> why I have a preference for, uh, you know, uh, Baroque music and not for, uh, for classical, you know. It's, it's not, the science says, well, this is nothing, you know. This really is nothing. Um, <clears throat> but you can ask then, what is art doing? And art, since it was really liberated by photography from the burden of representation, it's precisely dealing with that. Think about Malevich Black Square. It is the nothing. Think about, think about um, John Cage, 433. It is the nothing. Um, Erase the Conning by Rauschenberg. It is the nothing. The nothing is actually the, the very key concern of, um, of art. Yeah? And that again cycles back to the moment when art does not need to represent. Is Heidegger just taking on science or could his whole argument be expanded to take on everything that he actually can't describe? In he takes on the whole Western rational so, project. So, so eventually probably language is the most... Well, with language, you see, he is careful. He keeps language. But I will tell, it's a very good question and a very difficult one. And, and you are a, a Deridian, I can, I can tell. Uh, it is because anthropology, physics, uh, mathematics, it's all for him part of this project. Literature, history, historiography. Language, Heidegger says, is the house of being. We live in language. We are language. How we are installed in the world we are installed in the world in language. So language has a primal position that can also comes to the surface in poetry because of his you know, fascination and admiration of Holderlin and Rilke and these kind of people. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it, 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 language, poetry, art. And that's why he writes about Van Gogh's painting of the shoes. And that's why he writes about poetry so much. Because there he sees an alternative to the rational project. But everything that we call research for him is not that different ultimately when the chips are down from theology. Now it's, it, is, it is a child's game, it's like a, a child's uh, checkmate in chess to show that scientific thinking is ultimately religious. Because no scientific method can account for its own presuppositions. There is a very famous argument between two people who at least knew what they are talking about. One of them was Albert Einstein and the other is Niels Bohr, and uh, both um, <coughs> Nobel Prize winners in physics. And Bohr was telling Einstein, um, if there would be no one available to testify, you would not be able to prove that the moon is hanging there in the sky. And Einstein says, yeah, but even after the last person on Earth will disappear, the moon will still be there. And Einstein says, Perhaps, but you will not be able to prove it. So you will have to believe in it. Yeah? So that's how, that's what I said. It's, it's like a children chess. We're not, we're really, that's not what, what we are doing here. I want to try to understand what, what possibilities open up to think about the digital image in the context of stepping away from these representational uh, mechanisms. Um, inherited from Plato through uh, Descartes and <coughs> onto the Enlightenment. So let me give you another one of these Heideggerian uh, quotations. That's from Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics, a fantastic book. 
Anthropology is no longer just a name for a discipline, nor has it been such for a long time. Instead, the world describes a, fun the world describes a fundamental tendency of man's contemporary position with respect to himself and the totality of beings. That shows that it's not just the science, it's anthropology as well. What is anthropology for Heidegger? Anthropologos. Yeah? What, is what is important here is the logos of the anthropos. Anthropos is the human being. Yeah? The logos is the logic of the human being. Heidegger says, don't think about anthropology as the study of human culture, as normally people describe it on Radio 4. Think about anthropology as a worldview that puts the human subject at the center of the world. So everything in the world is understood according to the logic of the anthropos. Does it make sense? Yeah? It, it's not the study of the anthropos. You know, because you could say that, well, we can have an anthropology, and then we have an elephantology, and we can have a snakeology, you know? And no, 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 no. It's, it's another thing. It's, it's not the study of the anthropos as one of the species. It's the study of the world from the perspective or framed by the rational thinking of the anthropos. Now, here is a little trick you can use whenever you read philosophy and you need to make it useful. Oops, do you see that? <laughs> OK, that's, you can just replace some words with something that you are interested in and see whether it works or not. That, that already is not Heidegger. That becomes you. Yeah? And then, I'm not saying that this is incredibly profound, but it might work. And if it works, you run with it in your writing, in your art, in whatever you do. If it's not, then it doesn't. It's just changing a couple of words. Uh, but I think, I think in that case it does work because, and that is an interesting point, photography is not just one image-making discipline among others. It's not just one visual form among others. It, instead, it describes the fundamental tendency of man's contemporary position with respect to himself and the totality of being. Yeah? So that's what we could that's how we could understand photography as the, the image of the anthropos and the way by which the anthropos makes sense of the world. Yeah? I think it is quite useful to go from that to the next step of the um, I don't know what I wanted to do with that, but let's let's leave it for that. Let's look at this for a second. So how are we for time? Okay. We're okay. And now, here's my plan. And tell me if you agree with that. Um, I, would write, I would like to continue and maybe have five minutes for questions later. Yeah, because there's so much to cover and time is always against us. Are you okay with that? Or if you want to start, we can start to have an open discussion right now. We, can, we carry on, yeah? Because there is quite a lot. Okay, do you know this? This is Durer's. <coughs> artist painting a nude. <coughs> yeah? I want to use it to quickly explain to you what idealistic or, or representational philosophy is all about. Yeah? It's very crude. It is brutal, if you like. But I think it works. But you don't really need to um, accept it if you don't like Well, I would say this here we have two positions towards the world. The position of the painter, which is also the scientific man that, that Heidegger was talking about earlier, who investigates the world by basically measuring it. Yeah? Okay, so this is, we can call it anthropologism. Yeah? This is anthropology. This is viewing the world through the logic of rational thinking. Because this is the per the, that's how you build a perspectival painting. Dürer was very interested in making paintings about the technique of painting. In that sense, he is a kind of a meta-artist, a bit like Velázquez. Um, <clears throat> okay, now what about the other side? What about the 
how would you how would you describe the living experience of the person on this side? Well, because we don't have time, I'm going to answer this question. But <laughs> I think I think it is like someone who um, lives the world, lives their life sensually. Yeah, more like um, being more part of the world rather than observing it or, or analytically understanding it. So if this is the logocentric scientific approach to, to the world, this is the sensual approach to the world. Yeah? Um, that might be called anthropomorphism. Yeah. Or empiricism. Okay. Now this is the bit that the, you can really see how, uh, how it kind of helps to make sense of a lot of approaches. You can either, it's also interesting how, let's say, even the, the landscape behind, behind the window kind of repeats the shape of the woman. So, you know, suggesting that, that the body of the woman, and the body, the, the, there is a kind of continuity here. While behind the, the scientist, there is just this straight line and this kind of <laughs> spike cacti. Yeah? So, uh, so it's a very, there are very different worlds. Okay, but this is not all. The most interesting thing is this device. What is this device? <coughs> so that is the representational mechanism, the representational device through which the world is given. And when Kant, when Immanuel Kant, in his Critique of Pure Reason, speaks about transcendental idealism, he basically comes up with the question, how do we know about the world? How do we, um, he's trying to correct Descartes, who said doubt. For Kant, it was not enough. Because he said, doubt is always located in a specific space, in a specific time. There is, the, the, there is a, uh, there is cause and effect in doubt. There are some specific rules according to which any thought has to operate. You know, what comes before and what comes after. And these rules are not negotiable. These are the categories of thinking. You know, these are the categories of reason. That's why it's, it's a critique of pure reason. And these categories are basically the rules of, the, of representation. This is the frame here in between anthropomorphism and anthropologism. This frame is transcendental idealism. Transcendental idealism is our inheritance from Kant. And I think um, even you know, many of the 20th century thinkers, including people like Adorno um, and, and the whole of Frankfurt School, um, perhaps Marx, are kind of post-Kantian or carrying this Kantian inheritance. But this inheritance is basically to say <coughs> the world, we know the world as a representation, because representation is how we think about the world. Yeah, our thinking, our rational thinking, is representational. So that is Kant's big invention. Now, if that works, then what is Heidegger? Heidegger, obviously, neither in the, on the side of the <coughs> scientist, nor is he on the side of simply saying, you know, well, I feel it, it must be real. He is also not happy with representation. He is kind of asking, but how all this thing gets to be installed? How all this thing comes to be? OK. So we now can look at the essay. <coughs> Are you OK so far? You don't want to ask anything? Now I highlighted again. It's on the on, on Dropbox. I highlighted a few pieces, a few bits that are very interesting. Um, now, the critique of of the, the, the Heidegger's critique of um, rational thinking is, you know, you, you can see it all over this text. For instance, here he's saying. Science becomes research through the projected plan and through the securing of that plan in the rigor <coughs> of procedure. It's more or less the things I already mentioned. Um, uh, 
or, or this, for instance, physical science does not first become research through experiment. Rather, on the contrary, experiment first becomes possible where and only where the knowledge of nature has been transformed into research. Now, as you see, this, this quotation about nothing really helps to understand what he is saying here. In a sense, he says that the experiment becomes a device with which you can research the world only where the knowledge of the world is understood as a subject of research. And that suggests that there is, it's possible to have another relationship to the world which is not based on research. Which is what? <coughs> which is some form of, um, well, maybe it's, as they say sometimes, learning by doing. You know, not learning by making an experiment, but by the making itself, by the by the production or um, so I think this is a little bit interesting I will read it to you quickly experiment begins is it, is it, can you see yeah <clears throat> experiment begins with the laying down of the law as a basis to set up an experiment means to represent or conceive for students the conditions under which a specific series of motions can be made susceptible of being followed in its necessary progression. So you see, <coughs> the, the experiment is made possible by first agreeing on the representation as the windows through which the world is being revealed. Okay, so if we establish that, Let's go and look at uh, Okay, it is this is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, could I, I, I need to read the first the yellow paragraph and the one that is here uh, highlighted with the red as well. So could someone um, read please? No? Me again? Okay. Have you, have you got a problem with your voice? Do you uh, have a or something? I don't have a problem with my voice, but I think it's nice to hear some other voices. <laughs> <clears throat> when man becomes the primary and only <coughs> real subjectum, that means man becomes that being upon which all that is is grounded as regards the manner of its being and its truth. Man becomes the relational center of that which is as such. But this is possible only when the comprehension of what is as a whole changes. In what does this change manifest itself? What, in keeping with it, is the essence of the modern age? And this is the key, you see, in the next paragraph, that when we reflect on the modern age, we are questioning concerning, <coughs> we are questioning concerning the world picture. What does it mean? It means, as we saw here, that uh, that when um, when you let the scientific man represent the world, two things happen simultaneously. And that is really the key. Two things happen simultaneously. On one hand, the world becomes a picture. But that's not all. And the human being becomes a subject. So this is really, that, that's the most important thing. We so used to talk about subjectivity and objectivity and are you, are you being objective? Well, really these things mean completely the opposite from what we think they mean. First, first let's establish this, that representation and subjectivity are two sides of the, of the same coin. When the world 
is represented as a picture. The representer, he or she, but it's usually he, he for whom the world is represented becomes a subject. On the political connotation of the subject, as someone who is a subject to the rule of the state. Because what is the claim for the legitimacy of the contemporary state? Is it because of God? Well, no. The claim of state's legitimacy is that it is operating on rational principles. <coughs> that is the modern state. Yeah? And since the heads of the king has been chopped in the French Revolution, uh, authority doesn't come from God anymore, but from the elected representatives of the people, which is <coughs> representation again. So the authority of the state is in being based on rational principles. That's why you are a subject. Subject to what? Subject to the rationality of the state. Yeah? So when you choose representation, and I'm saying it to all the photographers here in the room, when you choose representation as your occupation or your hobby or your pastime, nearly willy you become a subject. Yeah? There is no one without the other. If you represent, you are a subject. Yeah? And what do you do as a subject? You don't go fishing. You represent. Any questions? Okay. So there's one. Um, if I'm a subject, it seems to, seems to imply that I'm subject to something. Also, not only. Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, 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 no, I, I, definitely, I definitely will. Um, to be, what does it mean to be a subject? Well, it means to assume a particular relationship to the world, which earlier Heidegger called anthropology. Yeah? It basically means to perceive the world from the perspective of the human being. But there is no human being anymore. The human being gone. Instead, we have a subject. And what does it mean? Don't think that the object is the opposite of the subject. Don't fall into that trap. Subject and object are basically interchangeable and really mean more or less the same thing. When people say that, when, when people talk about something as being objective, but what does it mean when something is objective? It is objective, it, nothing can be objective without a point of view. And whose point of view it is? That of the subject. Yeah. So <coughs> it's very interesting to see how this, no, how how much confusion and, and lack of clarity there is around these notions of subject and object. But what is opposed to the subject or the object? Because you know this is the subject and this is the object. Yeah, it's it's kind of you can see how they are, they are really the same. Um, what is opposed? is perhaps the nothing, the one thing that science wants to know nothing about. Yeah? But don't think that subject and, ob and object are binary opposites. Binary opposite, by the way, is the subject's favorite way of organizing the world in terms of language, um, let's say, <clears throat> written and spoken word, black and white, male and female, gay and straight, Christian and Jew, and whatever you like, yeah? That's, that is another way to represent. Whenever someone talks about binary opposites, they are already within the representational framework. The representational framework in subjectivity or objectivity, it's exactly the same thing, yeah? This is, kind of becomes very interesting once we move into talking in earnest into that digital <coughs> age, because there, or here, you can see how these notions get kind of slightly problematized. You know, it is maybe harder to be um, a subject when you are in an online space. You know, what does it mean to be a subject of <coughs> Snapchat? And we're going, to, we're going to investigate that. But for now, I just wanted you to have, <coughs> so to have some sense of... Uh, 
where Heidegger is going when he's talking about the picture. Um, so I don't know if we can uh, find something. Yeah. Um, so, just read that. I don't want to read it aloud, but just, just, just read that. So it's, it's the last sentence that you could really see as kind of encapsulating the whole discussion. The world picture is not a picture of the world. It's not like, you know, in Susan Zontag's famous description, you know, that we still live in Plato's cave and we connect, collect all these snapshots about the world and this is our picture of the world. No. Susan Zontag did not live in Um Heidegger is saying, it's not that we understand the world through pictures, it's that the world became or becomes a picture. Yeah? And when the world is conceived and grasped as a picture, who, can, who, who and only who can conceive and grasp the world as a picture? Only the one who is a subject. And now I have another 10 minutes. I want to get to the gigantic with you, and that will be the end uh, of the session. Um, and I think we are quite close. So it has another word, representation. It's all very entertaining. And I th it's, it's actually quite an easy essay to read. I think you will do well to go over it uh, later on. Um, And he does repeat himself quite a lot, which sort of um, he has to do. Um, yeah. So what happens when the world becomes a picture? And that's where I kind of start to get goosebumps because it is getting really close to the to the bone, to the real thing. A sign of this event, of the world becoming a picture, is that everywhere and in the most varied forms in these guises, the gigantic is making an appearance. Suddenly, the gigantic, the gigantic appears. And this is really interesting. What is this gigantic? It is that which is incalculable. So that is so interesting, you see? So we have this rational project of me measuring everything, putting everything into the boxes of elephants and snakes, you know, and the unicorn doesn't get in, you know, and everything is measured, and everything has its atomic weight, and there is a map of all the molecules and the chemicals. And in this process of measuring everything and making and converting the world progressively into a picture, something emerges out of this ordering that is completely wild and unordered. He calls it the gigantic. I will call it the web, if you like. It doesn't matter how you call it, but you get the point. We, what, what is, for instance, the internet? We created it, you know, we made it with our own little hands. Um, but what we made is inconceivable to us, incomprehensible <coughs> to not only to any single human being, but to anyone. Uh, so for instance, as you probably know, um, financial financial transactions now are done at such an incredible speed of millions of transactions per second. Is anyone here um, in um, in banking or in dark pools or anything like that? No. Um, but <clears throat> it is completely beyond any human comprehension. Yeah. So this is we we kind of made it. But what we made is incalculable, incomprehensible, and this is the, this is the where this representational project of subjectivity and anthropology gets us. 
the gigantic presses forward in the form that actually seems to make it disappear in the annihilation of great distances by airplane, in the setting before us foreign and remote words in their everydayness, which is produced at random through the radio by the flick of the hand. What is really quite interesting is that around the time when Heidegger is writing that, actually lay earlier, because he writing that already in the 50s, that's, that's one of his later essays after the Second World War, after, he, after his so-called denazification, like as if you can sort of denazify someone with chloride, I don't know. Um, uh, <coughs> he was allowed to teach, he was banned from teaching for 10 years, then he was allowed to go back to teach. And these are uh, some of the early, the first lectures he gave um, when he was uh, rehabilitated. Um, but around the 1930s, in physics and in mathematics, suddenly people start to deal with the incalculable. You know, I'm not going to talk about quantum physics because I'm sure uh, you know about it. But um, Godel, yeah, the great um, Austrian mathematician, proves that any mathematical system, even a simple system as arithmetics, is internally unprovable. There will be statements within any system that can be neither <coughs> proved nor disproved. And this insight into the undecidability of mathematics lies at the very foundation of the Turing machine. Yeah? So the Enigma code and the, and then the ultimate victory over the Nazi Germany um, is partly due to, the to this very undecidability. Yeah? In, in computing, in Turing machines, it's called the Halton problem. And basically, it means that uh, there are certain programs that you can run on the Turing machine, and you will never, you will not be able to predict whether the machine will stop or not. I mean, it's interesting. You can talk about it. You can also read about it um, separately. But what is happening at the moment when people are people who study algorithms look at algorithmic, at the way algorithms operate within algorithmic procedures, there are incalculable um, elements that can be, ni again, neither proved nor disproved. So suddenly, here we, have, here we created, through this rational representational <coughs> project, we created a reality which is neither rational nor representational, but in fact undecided or gigantic or incalculable. Because that's what the gigantic means. It means something, the gigantic is something that cannot be represented. Because, OK, what cannot be represented? Well, I just put a few things on the table. Um, infinity. Yeah. That's sort of big abstract concept. But another thing that cannot be represented is pain. Yeah. If you have a toothache, which I hope you want, uh, try to represent it. Now, you can describe it. You can shout about it. But you cannot really make anyone experience it. Yeah, you kind of come against the limitations <coughs> of representation when it comes to something like that. And that's why, by the way, um, Adorno says that I begin my philosophy from my own pain, from my own shame of being alive, from my own shame of surviving the Holocaust. Um, <clears throat> so, here you have it. Let's see if we have something else. Um, yeah. Read that. It's, it's supposed to be all highlighted. Uh, they just not, didn't work. Re re read this um, lilac text. <clears throat> you see, the gigantic becomes incalculable. Good morning, 21st century. Hello, new media. Welcome. We'll stop here. That's it. It's done. You can go home. <laughs> now, you don't need to go home because we still have five minutes. So now you can ask me questions or you can say uh, what do you think. <coughs> Yes. Oh, and then that needs to be kind of like this. But then I, um, 
question of the bottom. Sorry? The question of the bottom. Very good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, and uh, quite a few people notice that this notion of the this notion of the gigantic that Heidegger is talking about is not dissimilar to what Kant is talking about in the third critique, and which is the sublime. The sublime is also incalculable. Kant distinguishes between two forms of sublime, the mathematical sublime and the analytical sublime. The mathematical is the infinity, you know, this great money. It's basically when you are faced with what your rational reason can produce that your rational reason cannot comprehend. The analytical sublime is when you are um, sitting in your conservatory and watching a storm. And you are, you see, you know, the, the 19th century painters love this kind of the avalanche paintings, you know, or the this little boat on a massive wave, this sort of things, you know, all these kind of kind of surfing activities. It's all about the sublime. It's it's the it's experiencing a dreadful moment in the safety of your own existence. You know, it's this tension between something horrible happening and it's massive and kind of this massive nature that can just crush you like that but you are safe in your cocoon. This is the sublime. Um, so yeah, it's, um, and when we go, when we later get into, let's say, think, looking at Lyotard, when Lyotard writes his uh, um, book on um, the postmodern, he says, well, the postmodern is a form of the sublime. What, what is the sublime, essentially? The sublime <coughs> is non-representation. Yeah, so it's another way to grasp that which is outside of representation. So again, if you want to think about it photographically, you might want to ask, what does it mean for photography to engage with the sublime? Where is the photographic sublime? Yeah, it's, not a, um, it's, it's a difficult question because clearly taking a picture of the sublime will not get you there. Yeah, because that will be representation. So you need to somehow look outside the picture. That's why last time I was talking to you about the frame. Um, let me show, um, are there any, any, any more uh, questions? There is a very interesting principle that um, Aristotle speaks about, and then Leibniz. And it's called the principle of non-contradiction. A equal A. Yeah? In a sense, it is very much what Hegel says, all that is rational is real, all that is real is rational. A equal A. Um, <clears throat> this is the fundamental principle of science. Without that, there is no science. In, and, and that doesn't mean, it's not a tautology. You know, it doesn't mean that you have a, it, it means that it's a principle of non-contradiction. An A cannot be equal to a B. A can only be equal to an A. Yeah? Um, you can say it also, <coughs> like, uh, for instance, um, <coughs> 3 plus 2 equal pi. It's the same thing. This is an A and this is an A. It doesn't matter that they look different. What matters is that here you have a certain device that it's like a computer. We get three apples plus two apples, and we want to know what actually it means. So we send them into this machine, this black box. Do you see where I'm going with it? It goes into this black box, and the result comes out, five. What happens here, we're not entirely sure. Yeah? What is exactly happening in this equal sign? But the result is correct. So the operation of this sign, of this equipment, must be correct. This is the very fundamental principle of any black box and of any computer. Um, <coughs> this, <coughs> Heidegger says, the highest principle of the scientific discourse. And, and just to tie it slightly to what I said last week. So, something very similar was happening when a bottle gets into a frame and becomes suddenly an art object. Gets out of the frame and it's a bottle again. In the frame and it's an image. 
out of the frame and it's not. It is the same thing. The, the basic principle of scientific thinking is the equal sign or this logical operand. The basic principle of the visual is the frame. And it is also a logical operand. That's how representation operates. So, one way to you can sort of look at it, um, borrowing slightly from, um, <coughs> from um, Latour here, but it doesn't really matter. It's basically to say, actually, no, I'm not borrowing from Latour, I'm actually challenging Latour. Because he always says, if you want to find the truth of any statement, you take it and send it in, into the laboratory. And then the result is coming out. So, so we said, take that, send it into the laboratory, and the result comes out. Okay, but what about this thing itself? What if we want to know what? If we, want to know what? we know that 3 plus 2 is equal 5. But what the equal is equal to? What laboratory can we send the equal sign to in order to find out what is equal to? There is no such thing. Yeah? That really is the fundamental issue that Heidegger has with representation. And he says that it is a very similar, actually no, he doesn't really say that, but I say that. Um, there is a very similar situation with the visual image. Yeah? We know everything about the content of the image, but it's surprising, is, is it not, how little we know about the frame. Yeah? Look at any, take any photograph. Look at the very, very edge of the photograph. Yeah? What is this edge? What is this edge? I think it's, like, it's, it's a kind of a mystery. It is the limit between the image and the white space outside. It is, of course, part of the content of the image because it couldn't be. Um, it, it's, it can be anything else. But it's not only content. It is also the limit between <coughs> which... So it is content which is also not content. It's also kind of content and supra-content. Yeah? And that is just, and that is the edge. This is the frame. And we somehow all the time look into the image, into what it contains, and say, well, does it look like my grandmother? Or no, you know, I look so old in this picture. And we forget that actually the most fascinating thing is the frame. And here we will stop. Thank you. Thank you.